What's going on guys and welcome back to the latest installment in the MCU Rewatch Review Series. Myself, Graham Giusin Matthews, alongside the illustrious, the Doc, Chris Mueller. Chris, welcome back to the show. Thank you. And of course, for the, I think this is the eighth podcast that we've done, the first six movies, we did a phase one recap last week. Today we're talking Iron Man 3, the first uh, third installment in the MCU. We've had you know, all singular movies so far. We had Captain America 1, Thor 1, Hulk 1. No sequels, and you know, aside from the Iron Man movies. And uh, good reason for it, because obviously they made a lot of money. We talked about Iron Man 1, 2, so if you haven't already listened to those, definitely check those out. But of course, this was the first movie coming off of the Avengers the year before. This was released in May of 2013. Um, there was a year in between the Avengers and this one. So my first question for you, Chris, w- did you have lofty expectations for Iron Man 3 kind of coming off the spectacle that was the Avengers? A little bit, yeah. I mean, you know, like I said, I try never to have expectations. I just have hopes. But, yeah, you know, you go into this movie and you see, like, I, I, I like Guy Pierce, So hearing he was in the movie, I was very happy about that. Mm-hmm. And it just seemed like it was like, okay, now this MCU is a thing. Let's see how a solo movie looks in this world where there's been this big team up. So far, it seems like you just mentioned that. I was going to mention it later, but we were talking about during the Phase 1 recap about the best you know villains from the MCU in Phase 1. Can a case be made for Iron Man, just the movies themselves, having some of the best actors as villains between Jeff Bridges, you have Mickey Rourke, you have Sam Rock, uh, Rockwell, and now you have Guy Pearce as all the bad guys in the movies up to this point. All of them did a very good job. Well, and don't forget Ben Kingsley in this movie. Ben Kingsley, who is he again? The Mandarin. Oh, oh okay. Oh, well, the, man- the oh, fake course, Mandarin. Course. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he does a great job, too, for different reasons. And this war over the end, which we'll, we'll talk about later. But, uh, yeah, him as well. Who was, what was his name? Something Slattery. Tom Slattery? Trevor. Trevor. Trevor Slattery. Uh, so, would you say that Iron Man might have, like, I know certain movies, like Thanos is my favorite villain of the MCU, but he's not, like, attached to a certain trilogy. Would you say Iron Man movies have the best villains in terms of at least the actors that portray them? Um, that's tough because when you look at the villains in Thor's movies, I was going to say, hello. I mean, that's like, you have Tom Hiddleston. Yep. You just said Kate Blanchett, but Christopher Eccleston in Thor, the dark world, granted, not a great movie, not the best villain. Christopher Eccleston is an awesome actor. Mm -hmm. So that right there gives him a, bit of a pass especially because you know he's not even speaking english in the movie like he's speaking some weird elfish language so yeah yeah, it's weird but then you go to iron man 3 and it's like Kate blanchett alone would have been enough to sell the movie but then you throw goldblum in there it's like come on (laughs) yeah (laughs) like yes i'm sold i'm sold amazing movie and we'll talk about that down the road but it's such it's such a good movie now i want to watch it so I gotta wait until we get to that point, but uh, yeah, no, the actors that they bring in for these movies are just great, and you've said it before, I think we talked about it during our Iron Man 2 review, if I'm not mistaken, about how the Marvel movies were kind of guaranteed successes by this point, so people were signing on left and right for these movies, including Guy Pearce as the kind of the big bad in this movie, and he did a great job in addition to the Mandarin, which we'll get to. Um, again, like the little things I really like about the movie, they have the Doctor from the first, I forgot his name, but the Doctor from the first Iron Man movie, who uh, Stark is in the cave with and he builds the Iron Man suit with. We see him here in the flashback back to uh, Switzerland in 1999. That was really cool how they uh, they had that little explosion and uh, Happy thought it was Y2K, which was amazing. I completely forgot about that. <laughs> I thought that was really funny because um, it was on New Year's Eve. Why did Happy have a mullet? It would what, not have been you, in, that would not have been in style in 2000. That bothered think, me so much. Do you think he just watched um what is it Pulp Fiction and then was like inspired to have his hairstyle like <laughs> like what's his name from from Pulp Fiction? God, what's his name? Oh, Travolta. Yeah, Travolta. Yeah. You know, That's maybe he, like. he did kind of have that suit on, but like that would be such a weird meta thing with Samuel Jackson being in these movies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, it's a good point. That's a good point. Did not even think about that. It would have been hilarious to see Samuel Jackson and Happy Hogan in those in black suits next to each other. That would have been really funny. <laughs> that would have been great. We have no. There was no Nick Fury in this movie, right? 
Uh, in three? Yeah, in Iron Man three. I don't think so. Mm, yeah, I'm trying to think. I don't think so. But we do have Happy Hogan, though. Obviously, we're just talking about him. Uh, yeah, I don't think Fury's in this one. I mean, unless it's a really small role. No, yeah, I don't think so. Well, well, I asked that because he was in the first one, obviously, in the post credit scene. He was in the second one, a pretty decent role. Um, not seen here, probably, because we just got so much of him in the Avengers, which came out the year before, like I said. Um, yeah, Rhodey was sort of like that the main government contact in this one. Well, even even Rhodey, I was gonna say, up until the final quarter or so, I would say of the movie, there was a point where he was in the very beginning, and they introduced him as Iron Patriot. Well, first of all, is that a nod to anything? I wasn't sure. The Iron Patriot. I think that's a comics thing. Yeah, it's gotta be. I was gonna say they were making fun of it, and obviously he's War Machine. Now. It might have been a different character, actually. I'm not a hundred percent sure because it's weird because I believe more people have played. War Machine than just Rhodes in the comics. Oh, okay. So, the whole Iron Patriot thing might be a reference to a completely different character. I'm not a hundred percent sure. No, it could be. I have to look that up. I was just I wasn't sure if you had known that off the top of your head because they, they they mention it as if it's like it could be like a you know an Easter egg like in the Avengers movie when they say the Earth's mightiest heroes and whatever. Um, but speaking of Rhodey, Happy obviously kind of gets sidelined a quarter way through and we don't see him again until the end. Rhodey, we see him in the beginning. And then, honestly, until like the last quarter, I completely forgot he was even in the movie because he wasn't a he wasn't in most of it, which isn't that big of a deal. The only thing, though, is is that he's in a lot of Iron Man two, and the relationship that he has with Tony is a big part of that movie. Um, were you happy or disappointed or just content with the amount of Rhodey slash War Machine that we got in this movie? I mean, I knew he was going to be a side character, and I felt like he was in it enough because his character is doing something separate from Iron Man for most of the movies. So, you know, they were never going to give them equal weight to their stories. But I mean, I felt like his character was used decent enough considering he's basically the sidekick. And how did you feel about the evolution of not just the war machine suit, but the Iron Man suit? And we've talked about this before with the other two films and how, you know, I, I like how we just don't see the suit completely go from zero to 100 in this movie. It's like, oh, you know, it started out how it did in the first two movies, like with the suitcase in the last one. Um, here, like, he's obviously having a lot of issues with the suits, and obviously that plays a very big part in Ultron a couple of years later, and then in the suits being used against him. Um, but your thoughts on the evolution of the Iron Man suit and how it kind of goes from, you know, having issues in the beginning to him kind of fine-tuning it to find what works for him by the end of the film? I mean, in this movie, I felt like what they were doing was almost saying that he doesn't need the suit necessarily. Yeah, by the end, yeah. And he never really quite got that one suit of all the separate pieces to work right. At the so, end, yeah. I mean, like, it barely even worked at the end, and it's still screwed up when he tried to call it. He just ended up throwing it on the guy <laughs> Pierce and blowing it up. But, yeah. Um, yeah, I like how they even though the progression of technology is unbelievable because they're doing so many things that we're not even doing in real life. It is still cool that he didn't go right from building what was essentially a mechanical suit uh, out of scrap metal to nanotech. Like that took years. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was a good natural progression and showing him continuing to tinker with the different technologies was cool. Yeah, exactly, and I was going to say it kind of feels more realistic in that sense, a lot like with the first movie, which we kind of praised for having that realistic nature about it. I kind of got that sense from this movie, too, with the whole war on terrorism and everything else going on with the Mandarin and whatnot. Yeah. Felt a lot like, I don't know, my, my timeline is off here, but I'm not exactly sure when ISIS kind of came around, but it kind of gave me that vibe a little bit. With what, not That's not exactly what they were going for, of course. But they mentioned, the weird thing is that you mentioned in the first movie how it's a lot like it feels like 2003 with everything going on and, you know, coming off of 9-11 and whatever with the first movie. They mentioned Bin Laden by name here. So that actually happened in this universe. And then they just yeah. have additional terrorists on top of that. Did you like the fact that this movie kind of returned to that realistic nature that the first movie had with the terrorism and whatnot? A little bit, but then you also wonder, like, 
why weren't any of these superheroes dispatched to go hunt down Bin Laden? Like that's actually if a great. Bin Laden point. exists, and <laughs> if Bin Laden exists in this world, why is Captain America not like trying his hardest to find him? Yeah, why didn't Captain America? Why didn't they wake up Captain America right after nine eleven to go help with that? You know what I'm saying? Like there are. A I mean, lot there's of this. There's a, a strange theory that a lot of comic book enthusiasts talk about, and that's that superheroes aren't designed to create world peace. They're designed to keep the status quo. That's a good way of putting it. So you're you're never going to see a comic book where the superheroes have created world peace because that's not what they're designed to do. They're just designed to take out the villains that are too big of a threat for the regular military. And then when the regular military can do stuff, that's who takes care of stuff. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's weird that like in a world where the Iron Man suit exists, why are soldiers still being sacrificed every day? (laughs) So there's, yeah, there's a weird discussion to be had about that. But um, I liked the route that they took with this as far as making the Mandarin like it's not clear where he's from Mm -hmm. because he's not supposed to represent like one specific country. He's supposed to just resent represent like terrorism as a whole, I think. Yeah, no, exactly. Which is what I like. They don't, you know, they don't say that he's, you know, Russian or whatever. It's Russia versus USA. It's just kind of the world on the whole. Take no prisoners. He's kind of going after, I mean, obviously he's specifically targeting the United States, but I agree. It is cool how they don't really specify what country specifically he's from. Um, another thing too, what I kind of forgot about the movie was how with Tony specifically, they kind of make him to me a bit more relatable than he has been in some of the other movies. I mean, obviously he has the natural progression. I love that, you know, verbiage that you used earlier that can also be applied to not just the Iron Man suit itself, but Tony himself as well. Um, you know, kind of taking away the quick, you know, one liners and whatever that kind of made him a likable character in the other movies. In this movie, he is likable, but I feel like he's more so relatable too. A lot like with the in, in anxiety attacks that he goes through coming off of the, you know, fallout from the Avengers, which I'll ask about you in a moment. Uh, I'll ask you about that in a moment. But with the anxiety attacks and stuff, you know, that type of stuff that he suffers in this movie, do you feel that it added to the character of Tony? Was it not necessary? Was it something you didn't really think he needed to go through or whatever? No, I do think it was important for the character because, for one, he went through something that would cause PTSD in a person. Mm-hmm. So, like, you know, Cap, Black Widow, they're all used to war because they're soldiers. Mm-hmm. The Hulk is the Hulk. So, you know, he doesn't really carry the same burdens as a lot of people because the Hulk does that stuff. But. Yeah, with Tony, it's like he was just a regular guy who happened to be a billionaire. And then he was thrust into the situation where he's constantly risking his life and potentially willingly giving it up to save other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would definitely screw with somebody. And, you know, there are people who have critiqued the way ptsd was displayed in this movie and how quickly he got over it but again it's a marvel movie they're never going to dwell on anything serious for very long they're Mm. gonna they're gonna nudge the topic and tell you that it's there and then they're gonna move on yeah well so i think oh sorry go ahead i think i i think with that they did a decent job as far as like it, it it was a move that made sense and then also once he doesn't necessarily get over it in my opinion because in my opinion his ptsd continues to affect him all the way up into civil war and the reason he wants to create the ultron program is part of his ptsd of being so paranoid that this is going to happen again and it turns out he's right but that's still not necessarily a reason that a psychologist would accept, you know? Yeah, no, exactly. I didn't really think about that, but they don't really kind of beat you over the head with it the same way they do in this movie, which isn't a bad thing. I'm glad they do that, but it's not like, oh, it's another anxiety attack from Tony. Like, it's obviously just kind of implied, and it's the reason and the motivation behind why he does certain things, you know, from that point forward. But they mention the Avengers stuff a lot in this movie, specifically um, Harley Keener, the kid who he kind of forms a friendship with, which I'll ask you about in a moment. But with the Avengers, do you think this is a good fallout film from the Avengers? I mean, they even say nothing's been the same since New York. So it's not like, oh, aliens invaded. It's, 
it's all over, like, <laughs> back to normal life. Like, do they acknowledge it? And they, I- I'm glad. It's not like they completely ignore it. And it's like, oh, aliens are real, blah, blah, blah. Like, they even mentioned Thor's hammer coming out of the sky. Um, I think Aldridge Killian did. And they're like, you know, they, they make light of the fact that nothing will ever be the same since that film. Yeah, I, I mean, I think with Iron Man, I mean, up until his death, he's the linchpin of the MCU. So using him as the come down from the biggest movie in the series up to that point was smart because that's the character everybody's known since the beginning. And at this point in the series is easily the most popular character. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, people definitely. love Iron Man. It makes sense. It makes sense to kind of focus on him coming out of the movie and also considering the sacrifice that he made at the end of the uh, at the end of Avengers too. It just kind of makes perfect sense. So you mentioned earlier Guy Pierce as Aldrich Killian, the big the big bad in this movie, whatever. Um, what were your thoughts on how Rebecca Hall uh, Hall did not heal? Uh, I wrote down heal for some reason. Hall, Rebecca Hall, um, how she did as Maya Hansen, kind of his old flame from years ago that comes back as part of the bad team, but has that redeeming moment at the end. Yeah, I feel like that was a a bit of a red herring that. It's like at first you almost think like, oh, is she going to try and create a love triangle? And then that doesn't happen. (laughs) And then you're like, oh, well, was she really the big bad? No, she's not really the big bad. And then she ends up dying. Like it was a very strange uh, character that just, I don't know, like she was almost just there to facilitate creating a relationship between Iron Man and Killian, like the fact that she was with Iron Man and now she's working with Killian. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I don't think they necessarily did a lot with the character and she wasn't really an important character. So it's not like she needed a lot done, but it felt like they were positioning her to be more important than she ended up being. So at the end there, this is what I was kind of confused about. She threatens to shoot herself or whatever when Killian has Iron Man, you know, in, you know, they, they have him captured and whatever. And then he all just and en- just ends up shooting him. He he ends up shooting her himself. Aldridge does. Uh, so what, was she trying to kill herself? Because if she did, the whole thing would blow up. Like, can you explain that scene to me? Well, I think she was implying that if she died, the knowledge of how to keep his condition under wraps would die with her. But like he had already figured it out. Oh, okay, okay. And then so yeah, it was kind of like if you don't want to end up like everybody else, you need me and. He's like, well, no, I don't. And then just shot her. <laughs> so then, again, this is kind of jumping to the end, but then how did Tony figure out, all right, we can fix Pepper? I mean, obviously they say, oh, we did some tinkering with the test or whatever, I think he said. Uh, how does how does he figure it out? If Aldridge doesn't tell Tony, then how does, I mean, it's just implied, like, oh, machines can fix anything, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, at this point, Tony Stark is the smartest person in the world, and you know, they just sort of imply like once he puts his mind to something, he'll figure it out. I mean, that's like we talked about before with the time travel being solved in an afternoon. Like, mm-hmm. you know, at this point, if you have a problem, even if it's not his area of expertise, Stark will figure out a way to fix it. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Makes sense. It kind of felt a little bit like, oh, we we fixed her. Like she's all set because and they never bring up her powers again for Pepper right after this. It's never acknowledged again. Well, because she doesn't have the powers anymore. It's like they figure out a way to get all that out of her. And the extremist stuff that he's using, that Guy Pierce is using in the movie, does actually play a big role in the first season or two of that Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. show. Oh, does it really? I didn't know that. Yeah, there's a character who's sort of uh, a side character in the show called Deathlock, and he's from the comics, and he's kind of a half cyborg, half human. And he starts out as a member of some project where they're using extremists to enhance people through these uh, implants, not by just injecting them right into their skin. Oh, okay. So, hmm. yeah, he's a, he's actually a really cool character that I felt like needed to be in the show more often. But I think the actor was just probably too busy to take a full-time role. Yeah. Well, no, it's cool they bring it up again. It's not just a thing for this movie, and then it's never brought up again or whatever, which is cool. Um, I wanted to ask you too, President Ellis, is he in any of the other MCU movies or no? Uh, he's in a bunch of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., but I can't remember him in any of the other MCU movies. Yeah, I was going to say, just it seems, wouldn't you think that we would see the President of the United States a bit more in these movies than we do? Yeah, but at the same time, I feel like 
Marvel has a decision to make when they put the president in a movie. Do we have somebody representing the real president right now? Do we have somebody who's kind of similar to them? Or do we go in the exact opposite direction? Because if they had gone with who was actually in office when this movie came out, it would have been Obama, right? Yeah, of course, yeah. And obviously they didn't do that. They didn't even try to get somebody who was black. They just went with a white guy. Yeah. And they're like, well, that's... You know, there's a good bet that there's going to be another white guy in office at some point, so this movie <laughs> will will fit right in any time period. So I think it's smart not to put the president in the movies too often, just because if you try and make it relevant to the current president, then it dates the movie. And if you don't, then it looks weird when it comes out. Yeah, and I like too, I will say, it is a little weird we don't see him more, but I like the fact they kind of got that card out of the way because I feel like it's one of those tropes in a lot of movies, like even Die Hard, not the president himself, but like the president of a corporation or a business where the bad guy always goes after them for the power. Like they're, they always get kidnapped at one point or another. The vice president in this movie is behind it. It's like, it's one of those obvious bad guy things, but we don't see that revisited again. It's not like he's a damsel in distress for the remainder of the MCU and he's like, he's like Peach from the Mario, the Mario games and whatever, and he's always getting kidnapped. We see him once, he gets kidnapped, he gets saved, and that's it. I, it, I mean, logically, it would make a little more sense if we saw more, but you do make a good point, though. Um, but I also wanted to ask you, this Iron Man movie, to me, kind of felt... At least, in my opinion, the darkest of the three installments up to this point. Um, do you think it was necessary for us to get that more serious side of Tony Stark in this film? Well, I think to tell the story they wanted to tell, yeah, because it was a story about PTSD and the fact that they kind of tied in the military a little bit by having the experiments on the soldiers be what produced these people who are working for Killian. Um I don't know if I'd say it's like, I wouldn't call the movie a dark movie, but it's definitely the darkest of the three Iron Man, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it, I think it worked for what it was, because the Avengers was a, even though it was like a, you know, the world is at risk, it's a pretty light action movie. Mm-hmm. And yeah, exactly. it's good that different Marvel movies do feel different. Otherwise, you run the risk of just everything feeling exactly the same and nobody's going to care after a little while. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, going back to the Avengers thing too, it was cool that with the, again, the darker nature, I wouldn't call it a dark film myself either. Like you said, definitely the darkest of the three, but it was nice that there were actual consequences from, you know, that the, the, the first Avengers film and it wasn't just forgotten about, which is why this movie kind of has that feel to it. Um, just a little thing, you know, the, the some of the one-liners in this movie are great when they have, um, when Maya first, you know, gets to the house at the Iron Man, you know, Tony's place or whatever, and he's bickering back and forth between, you know, himself and Pepper Potts, and they have, like, the big bunny there that we don't get to see again. I was hoping that it would come back at the end of the movie. It didn't. Um, but he was talking about, oh, it's a big bunny. Relax about it. That was a great line when they have... Um, Tony escaping at the end of the movie and he's taking out all the guards himself. I think that was when he had the suit at that point, or at least a part of his suit. And he was about to... <laughs> he had like one arm and one hand. Yeah, one exactly. Arm and one yeah. Leg. Before the rest of it came because it was the other parts were in the barn. And he they had the same prisoner from Iron Man 2. So in Iron Man 2 at the very beginning, you know when they first show Mickey Rourke sitting in the cell and they bring in a prisoner and he's just using that as like a another body so when he you know what i'm saying remember that scene from iron man 2 when he he blows up the cell that guy is one of the guards in this movie did you know that the the guy who mickey rourke kills in the cell is the same he's like that actor was a guard in the movie yeah i don't think he's actually okay he must have been dead because they said mickey rourke they said whiplash was dead so he must be dead but yeah it's the same actor though it's the same guy if you go back and watch it it's the long (laughs) i think he kills him in this movie it's the well the, the the piece of the suit comes through the window and it knocks him out so i don't know if he's actually dead but uh, it was weird, though, because it was, you know, maybe it's the same guy. I don't know, but they pronounced him dead in that movie, so I don't know. But just a random thing that I noticed. Um, I mean, it's Marvel's done that on accident before. Like, uh, God, I can't think of her name, but you remember the woman who approaches Stark in the hallway at the beginning of Civil War about her dead son? Yes, yeah, but yep, I like, remember that. She's, she's one of the main villains in in the series Luke Cage, which is supposed <laughs> to take place in the same universe, like that same exact actress. That's weird. And then uh, when Peggy catches Steve making out with that one girl 
and oh, like yeah. kind of gets upset about it. In the first that movie, same yeah. actress plays Chris Pratt's mom in Guardians. The, really? Same actress. That same woman that he kisses. Yeah, same actress that plays the dying mother. I know she was in that movie, but I forgot she... I didn't know she was in that role. I thought she was in the scene... I had heard somewhere that she was in the scene where he was chasing the Hydra guy after he first gets the powers. I heard that she was on, like, as an extra on the street. I didn't know she was making out with Captain America. That's crazy. Yeah. So, yeah, they've done that before. So it wouldn't surprise me if it's just a matter of, like, production companies using certain agents that represent certain people, and those people end up getting cast more often. And let's face it, when you're a henchman... Nobody's going to recognize you if, if they change your hair and and what you're wearing. Yeah, no, exactly. I didn't. I mean, I didn't put that together because he was on screen in, in Iron Man 2 for all of five seconds. Like, <laughs> yeah. Didn't yeah. have a single line. And in this one, he just has like one line about knowing the distance between mm-hmm. wherever the hell they are and yeah. where his suit is. Like, Which is so it was a That was a funny, weird thing, though, when the guy's like... 637 miles and the other guy looks at him he's like I'm good like that like I was, gonna say, it was just such a that? weird little that thing line? it's like oh this henchman is a genius with distances <laughs> like what a weird odd little fact but um, it's little stuff like that that make the movie feel real like those henchmen all of a sudden like he had a personality because of that one line <laughs> yeah him and I thought it was the same guy I guess it wasn't it was another guard but when he was about to kill the guard and he just puts down the gun he goes honestly I hate we- I hate working here they're so weird I thought that was a great moment too yeah that you was know? really funny because that's another thing in movies is you see all these faceless henchmen getting killed by all these superheroes mm. and you you have to wonder like do all of them know like that they're working for these evil people or do they <laughs> think they're just guards like I know some you of know, them would have to surrender, right? It's like, all right, listen, I don't give a shit about this place. I just don't want to die. Like, you would think that would happen more often than it does, but it might be too realistic. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a scene in one X-Men movie where that happens. Something similar happens with Wolverine. Oh, okay. Yeah, you don't see it happen too often in superhero movies, but it is it is pretty funny when it does. And they played it off here great. Um, yeah. The other thing I wanted to ask you about was with uh, the kind of the relationship. We 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 learn a lot about Tony and his dad, Howard Stark, in Iron Man Two. That's a big part of that movie. No mention of uh, Howard Stark in this movie. No sight of him. But we kind of get that father son relationship between Tony and the kid Harley Keener. Uh, what were your thoughts and how they kind of progressed that over the course of the movie? Um, I don't know. I at the time I didn't really think that kid was necessary but now i'm sort of understanding that like that lays the groundwork for another person to potentially wear the iron man suit down the line Mm -hmm. so like even if it's not that same actor all they have to do is say like this is the same kid and people are like oh well he has a real existing relationship with tony maybe pepper decides to give him the suit as a gift or something do you think that's where they're going with this? Because he did pop up again at the end of Endgame a couple of years later. It's certainly possible. Um, I know that in the in the comics, there's like a young girl who's wearing the Iron Man armor right now. Oh, okay. But in the movies, it feels like they're trying to set up a lot of different young characters. Like they show Hawkeye working with his daughter on the bow. Mm-hmm. So maybe down the line, Hawkeye's daughter takes up the mantle. Like, who knows? And uh, Ant-Man's daughter, too. Yes, and she is a character in the comics. I think her name is Stature. Oh, interesting. So, like, that will probably happen. Yeah, I could see them. I've, I've heard talks about a Young Avengers film. Not anytime soon, but, like, maybe down the road that might be something they explore. Uh, which, I mean, it's it's not forced because it seems like a lot of these characters are slowly but surely introducing, which is kind of cool. Um, you mentioned the Mandarin earlier. How did you feel about the Swerve when we find out that he's not actually who he says he is? Uh, I didn't hate it as much as a lot of people did mm-hmm. because I didn't, I didn't care about the character from the comics. Like, I guess in the comics, the Mandarin is one of Iron Man's most famous foes. And the fact that it ended up being Aldridge Killian, who was really pulling the strings and the Mandarin was just this fake dude is like really upsetting to some people, even though they have retconned that already. Like they've already established that there is actually a Mandarin out there. 
And they're using him in the new uh, Chang Chi movie. Right. And he actually, they there was one of those Marvel one shots where they showed uh, Ben Kingsley in prison. And then, like, at the end of it, they sort of imply that the real Mandarin comes to get revenge. Oh, really? Oh, wait, yeah, I think I've heard about that before. You said, yeah. You said that was from where, I'm sorry? One of those Marvel one-shots, so it was, like, a short film that they produced for a DVD release or something, and it's it's his character in prison. You can find it on YouTube, I'm sure. And I think at the end, like, they don't show him, but the real Mandarin shows up and opens his cell or something. Oh, yeah, I know. I've, I've definitely heard of that before. I don't think I've seen the full scene, but I was wondering where that was from, whether it was, like, a deleted scene or, like... Yeah, but yeah, I, it was I, probably I, planned to be a post credit scene, and then they went in a different direction. And we're like, well, let's just put it on the DVD as an extra. And yeah, yeah, yeah actually, it might have been that makes sense because the I mean, actually in the post credit scene in this movie kind of made sense too, although it was meant for more comedy than anything serious. But it might have been one of those things where they think to themselves, okay, we're not going to use this guy anytime soon, the Mandarin, so we'll probably just hold off on this because they did end up going back to it like you said or you know they are going to go back to it in the Shang-Chi movie which is cool and the whole 10 rings thing and whatever um but the I yeah. I was, I was going to say too the uh the barrel of monkey scene when they're falling out of the sky and he has to catch them all but he's not actually in the suit I thought that was great and they kind of alluded to that earlier when he's controlling the suit back at the house with Pepper but he's not actually in it he's just downstairs um that was pretty funny the final battle with all the suits and uh, him, you know, the, the knocking off all the guards and whatever with the extremists. Um, you know, I thought that was a good scene. What were your thoughts on that final battle scene with Pepper coming back to save the day and War Machine being there and they got to save the president? Blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, it was a, it was just a big special effects spectacle. And Marvel does that as well as anybody or better. So, I mean, you know, it was good. Uh I thought bringing all the Iron Man suits in was kind of cool because you did get to see little Easter eggs from suits from the comics. I that, figured, like, yeah, there were a lot yeah, of suits, that, yeah. yeah, so it, it was fun for that, but, you know, it was... There's kind of a, a curse with the Marvel movies where a lot of them just end with some big action spectacle special effects scene, and I think they're sort of trying to move away from that a little bit with some of these movies, but... Yeah, it, it definitely just felt like, just like explosion, 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 one-liner, explosion, explosion, explosion. <laughs> and I think that's maybe why people turned on this movie a little bit was because it did start to have that repetitive feel a little bit at points. It felt like a Michael Bay movie at certain points. Yeah, absolutely. But the one thing I feel like this movie doesn't get enough credit for is the whole like the Mandarin heel turn thing. Like I do think that was genuinely unexpected for most people. It like, did they didn't me, see it yeah. coming and because it deviated so far from the comics. And I think it was a risk that Marvel took knowing like, yeah, this might upset some of the fandom, but I, it, it's going to also be a genuine surprise. Mm hmm. And that's like that's why so many people were pissed at the last Spider-Man movie because like the trailers are all like, look at this other hero named Mysterio, and every comic book fan's like, that guy is a huge villain. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> obviously he's the villain of this movie. Yeah. So that was telegraphed from a mile away. So I like that they went in a different direction. And Ben Kingsley, I felt like in that scene where uh, Stark and Rhodey are interrogating him, like he was genuinely funny. In that, that was scene. hilarious. That was great. Yeah. Like he, he's falling asleep and watching <laughs> yeah. the soccer game and offering them a beer. And like, it was hilarious. And yeah, I understand that some people were pissed off, but it's like, it was a genuine surprise. And if they can do that, then I think they should. It was funny when they go, oh, would they offer to get you off the drugs? He's like, no, they gave me more. I thought that was funny, too. Just the, the whole scene is just really, really funny. Um, right, and then they're like, oh, they gave me a boat, and then they're like, we need your boat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, that was great. Was I was going to ask you this, too. Was the guy in the um, camera car, with the, the, the news car, whatever, the news truck, whatever, was that anyone significant that you know of the major Iron Man mark? Um, cause it seemed like, and not that it was random, but maybe they were just trying to show how famous he is and whatever. Was that anyone notable that cameo or no? Was it just running some random dude? Uh, Adam Paley. He's an actor, comedian. Um, he was on a show called happy endings with Damon Wayans jr. Hmm. I don't think I've heard of it. 
it was a good sitcom actually uh yeah, he's just like a comedic actor. He's been working for a while. I think they just put it in there because it was kind of like a, we need Iron Man to get access to this stuff. Let's just make this guy be like a huge Iron Man fan. And they just cast a comedian because he could pull it off. And we've mentioned this before, like the overlaying theme of the ACDC music. It just fits Iron Man perfectly, obviously. They had his, they had ACDC music in the first movie, second, Avengers, no ACDC music, as far as from what I could hear and from what I can remember, there was no ACDC songs in this movie. Do you Did you notice that? Do you think it might have been done by design to kind of move away from the traditional Iron Man values and, like I said, kind of give this movie a different spin, so to speak? Maybe. I mean, this was the first one that Favreau didn't direct. This was Shane Black. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. So that could have just been a choice on his part. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Interesting. But I do want to ask you this about the ending. So this is something that kind of confused me because when you watch the ending, without watching anything else, forget like the last 20 movies, you watch the ending, you would think, wow, the guy's done his Iron Man. He throws the rest of the armor, whatever, at the place where he used to live. He's done. Like he doesn't need Iron Man. You said that earlier. They kind of tell that story here where... He doesn't add to win. He doesn't need to be Iron Man. And it kind of, they tell the story of him retiring, riding off into the sunset, almost quite literally in his car. And um, it, it seemed like, it really seemed like they were closing the chapter on that Iron Man book. But then he was back two years later in Ultron, like nothing ever happened. And they even say at the end of this movie, when they put blah, 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 will return, it says Tony Stark will return, not Iron Man. It was yeah. you know what are your thoughts on that? Was that like a retcon thing, or were they just going in a different direction? Was that a director decision? What's going on with that? There was a there was a point during these movies where uh, his contract had expired, and he wasn't a hundred percent sure. Okay, if he was going to make more, and then he chose to come back and make more because they offered him a shitload of money. <laughs> so that may have had something to do with it. And then it was fixed before release. And that's why they were able to claim he would be back in the credits. But yeah, I don't remember when exactly that happened, but it might've been right around this time. Cause they all sign contracts for a certain number of movies. Yeah. And by this point he had fulfilled four movies, right? Um, Cause I, all three Iron Man's plus Avengers. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, we're not counting Hulk, right? The cameo obviously. in Hulk was a favor yeah. that he did for Marvel, so four, basically. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess that would make sense. Yeah, I was curious about that. It just seemed weird. But then you said they throw in the line at the end that he will come back, but they say Tony Stark will be back. Is that anything significant, or is it just like, oh, he's not Iron Man for right now, or whatever? Yeah, I mean, yeah, like we were talking about, this movie sort of establishes that it is it is Tony Stark that makes Iron Man special, not the other way around mm-hmm. so yeah i think there was definitely a little significance to that as far as making the choice to say tony stark instead of iron man now this it's probably almost definitely a contract thing as to why they did what they did with the ending but one takeaway that it kind of had from the post credit scene where it's revealed that he's been talking to bruce banner the entire time so it was cool to see him do you think that in him, the whole movie's from his perspective. It's from his point of view. Do you think he kind of changed the end? Like, it's like a Deadpool type thing where he kind of tells the story as he wants it to be told. Do you think that might have been him in his own head thinking to himself, oh, I'm done with Iron Man, and that wasn't the way it actually happened? Or is that me probably just thinking like, too much into it? I mean, they never really imply throughout the movie that he's an unreliable narrator, so I think he probably did tell the story as it happened. Good point, yeah. Because usually if a character is an unreliable narrator, there's signs. Like the Joker or something like that. That's that's kind of what I was thinking of with the Joker movie that came out last year and how that might be an unreliable narrator type situation, you know? Right. So, yeah, I think with this, it's it's probably just assumed that that's actually what happened and the little tag with Hulk was just a funny little way to show that these two guys were still friends after Avengers. Did you like the post credit scene with him and Bruce? Yeah, because it was... It was like the first time, other than obviously the shawarma scene, when the post credit scene was really just for comedic purposes and mm-hmm. not to set up another movie. Yeah, I was I was gonna say that because I know some people. Not the shawarma scene was cool, but like, but, but you know, come what was it, uh, Homecoming when they did the comedic thing with Captain America, people were pissed 
about that whole, oh, you waited this long for Some people to... were. I thought it was funny. I thought it was funny, too, but for, you know, everyone that I talked to about it after it came out were, were mad that they waited that entire time for something where, like, they trolled like you they, on purpose. What they had it? a mid-credit They had a mid credit scene with uh, Vulture, what's right? Ke- Keaton in jail, so it's like they had a post credit scene True. That, True. that served the story. The second one was just a bonus. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, finally, let me see. I think that was everything except for one final question. The most important question of them all, Chris, is Iron Man 3 a Christmas movie? Is it a Christmas movie? Um, I mean, I, I forget that this movie takes place during Christmas. So did I. Like... Yeah, they have a couple of mentions of it, and there's, like, he uses the ornaments as bombs and, you know, that kind of stuff. But, yeah, it really didn't feel like Christmas had anything to do with it so, in any way. And I know some people would say the same thing about Die Hard. Exactly, but, that's what I was going to say, yeah. But the difference is that, like, so <laughs> this this movie was released, what, like, it's in May. <laughs> yes, it's, it literally is far back from Christmas as you could possibly get for the most part. Right. So, yeah, you're like six months in between. It's, yeah, I wouldn't call this a Christmas movie. It's just a movie that happens to take place during Christmas. It, it just seems so random because I'm watching this back yesterday and I'm like, why? What, what's with the. I had no idea. Like, it's not just one little mention of Christmas. They mention it multiple times. They have music playing at one point, which some people are like, oh, there's a Christmas song. It's a Christmas movie, which I think is bullshit, but whatever. Because um, he's listening to the music while he's putting the suit on at the beginning of the movie. They show snow. They have not a Christmas miracle. I think mean, that's crap, but. Um, they have a lot of mentions of Christmas. It's like, oh, you know, it's it's Christmas time, blah, blah, blah. And they mention at the end, he's got the the bunny that says Merry Christmas on it, Pepper. Like, there there is a lot of Christmas mentions in this movie, and I couldn't understand why. Because usually Marvel's like, oh, you know, it's coming out around this time. We'll make it this type of movie, blah, blah, blah. This came out in May. So it just seems really bizarre. And would that mean, yeah. actually, would that mean that this movie actually takes place in... December of 2012 after Avengers as opposed to 2013 not a major thing but would would that would probably be what it was right probably and that might be a Shane Black thing because he's made other movies that like take place around Christmas too hmm interesting I think uh, another Downey movie actually with him kiss kiss bang bang like that takes place at Christmas even though it has nothing to do with the story <laughs> maybe just a big Christmas fan I don't know but. Yeah, maybe. I mean, the the thing with Die Hard is, like, you play a Christmas song during an action scene. It's kind of funny. It is So funny, yeah. they probably just do that sometimes in movies. They're like, well, we have to establish what time of year it is. We might as well <laughs> say it's Christmas. Yeah. Because no other time period, like, has that same, like, oh, it's Thanksgiving. Like, aside from, uh, what was it, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, there's not many Thanksgiving movies out there, but... Uh, yeah, no, I, I had to mention the Die Hard thing, too, because you know for a fact, because I'm of the belief that it's a Christmas movie. Would you say the same or no? Yeah, I, I, I classify Die Hard as a Christmas movie, but I, I only do it because it's, like, it's funny <laughs> to classify <laughs> yeah. it that way. Like, obviously, you're not going to classify that as the same as you would Miracle on 34th Street or even National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation is more of a Christmas movie than that. Absolutely. It's just funny to classify Die Hard as a Christmas movie because of, you know, the now I have a machine gun, ho, ho, ho. And <laughs> yeah. all, all the little just random stuff throughout the movie. It, it It's just funny to do it, and it's funny how that debate comes up online every year or two. Like, uh-huh. no, it's not a Christmas movie. Yes, it is. It's like the fact that people care so much about it is what's funny. Yeah, no, I agree. The, it, the funny thing is that I, A, do believe it's a Christmas movie, and B, I say it's a Christmas movie just to piss people off for those people that actually think it's not, which it really is all subjective, but it's a great debate every year nonetheless. Um, real quickly, your final takeaways on Iron Man 3, and also, I think you've said this before, do you rank this at the bottom of the three movies, or would you put it at number two over over number two? It's it's tough. I'd say two and three are kind of right around the same level of quality. Like 
they're mid-level Marvel movies, you know, they're, they're not forgettable necessarily, but they're also not the standout performances for this character. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a fun movie. And I think if you're going to watch the MCU, you should watch it because it's, it's a good advancement of the Tony Stark character. Oh, most definitely. I think it's it doesn't you know complete his character arc. I would obviously that kind of comes in Endgame, but you know it continues it. And I think it's a very good Fallout film from Avengers, as I said earlier, and kind of uh you know tying the loose ends between this and what we see in Age of Ultron years later, which he still is you know very much dealing with the anxiety, as you said, and kind of stuff of that nature. But uh yeah, Iron Man three in the books. This was great. People could check out more reviews in the MCU Rewatch Review Series right here on YouTube. The next episode is going to be covering Thor The Dark World. So Thor number two coming up next week right here on the show. Chris, this has been great as always. People can find you, of course, on the Twitter machine at BR underscore doctor. Chris, thanks as always. This was great. Oh, yeah, of course. Absolutely. Take care, dude. I'll talk to you next week. All right. Take it easy. All right. Adios.